sometimes, but often a slummocky little uzzy to my sorely tried man, to the ribald boys at college behind the door, and to my best friend Gladys, just Paul. was born in 1914 in the Forest of Dee, the daughter of a coal miner. At the age of 14, while still very much a child, family poverty forced her to leave the forest to go into service. It was a brutal transition to womanhood, and like many of her generation, it has left its indelible mark, a sudden loss of childhood that has haunted her all her life. I only remember my childhood as marvellous. It was tough sometimes when you're a little girl, you know, and you can't have pretty clothes, and I used to feel a bit miserable on times, but I was aware, even in my, as a child, how really how lucky I was. Coal was the mainstay of the Forest of Dean's economy, but after the immediate post-war boom, the coal industry collapsed. The forest, like many of the other parts of the country dependent on coal, became a depressed area. The miners fought a bitter and hopeless battle to maintain a living wage. For a child in the forest, there was the stark contrast of the beauty around her and the ever-present fear of starvation. Winfried grew up in Briarley, a mining village in the heart of the forest. It was an isolated community cut off from its neighbours by the dense woodland around. Today, it is very different. The mines are gone, the houses modernized, the children more mature and sophisticated than their fresh-faced fellows of 50 years ago. The village straggled up the side of a fairly steep hill, and most of the houses were built by the uh, ancestors of the people who were living in them. Gradually, the people better off tended to go to the bottom end of the village and the people at the top end of course where there was just like a, a goat track in those days around the village they were more cut off than ever of course the uh, sedate end of the village uh, they didn't rely on each other very much so it wasn't quite such a friendly atmosphere as up the what i'd call the poor end because there could bit of borrowing lending had to go on. And the forest, well, it, it had such an effect on me that and eventually, although we lived in London at the time, I had such a longing to come back to the, to the green the forest that I used to have a regular dream that I was lying down on a bank and it was wet and fresh, and I was crying. I was crying on my face into this green grass. And even as a child, it used to stop me in my tracks. It was so beautiful. The lushness of the green and the lovely warmth and foxgloves and ferns, it was really lovely. It was a sort of ecstasy, really. My father was an extraordinary man. When he grew up, he had to go in the pit. There wasn't much work. He had to go down to Wales. And through going down to Wales to look for work, he lodged on, in a farm labourer's cottage and married my mother, who was the daughter. He got out of anything he could to read, and he was a political animal. 
in a very humanist way. But in the eyes of the mine owners, Charlie Mason's humanist views made him a potential agitator. He became a marked man. I think that's why our childhood was perhaps a little tougher than the average in the village because he was victimized for a couple of years. There was no work for him. No one would give him any work on two occasions. Uh, even if he walked miles to get a job, they would still turn him down because his name had got known, you see. And it was terrible for Father because what he did love was his bit of tobacco. And I've seen him as he used to do, pick coats for leaves and dry in the oven to smoke. And he was sick one day and out there were a virgin and I said, oh, but he said, it's awful hard to go without me, bit of smoke. Going to Cinderford with Ma'am, that was quite exciting. Um, of course, in the early days, we always had to walk there. But the, the, the shops, you know, the lights in the shops and uh, looking at all the pretty things and doors and... Oh, yeah, it was very exciting to go to Cinderford, especially if we, you know, Ma'am would, as I say, take us into the market and buy us some peas or perhaps even buy us a few sweets. And of course, when I compare food today and food as I've known it later, we were hungry, quite a... It was a, a natural... We accepted it naturally. Um, so she had to rely on the charity of the baker. And so we wouldn't ask for a second daughter a piece of bread even if we knew we wanted it because we knew Mother couldn't give it to us. We were poor, but I still think we were rich. Like, we had an old-fashioned fireplace. We had something, we had a centre to our lives, that fire. I had some books given me by a wonderful cripple, well, was more or less a cripple in the village named Goggy, called the Bluebird. And there were stories in there, and there was one about uh, the richest girl in the school. Which of course I was for ages. I was the richest girl in the school. I had long curls, which I used to flip back, imaginary ones, and I used to wear a proper gym slip. Because my idea, real Evan in the way of clothes, was to have had a gym slip. Mother more or less had to rely a great deal on charity for us for clothes. Of course, sometimes my aunties from service would be working where there were children, and they would sometimes be able to bring something home for us. But very often, Mother had to cut down and make up with what she could get out of. I mean, I've had more some outlandish stuff when I was a child, and when you're a little girl, it can be a bit humiliating on times, especially underwear, you see. It was very difficult, and I remember my, my drawers was a problem to me. In any village, there's always one or two girls who are lucky. In a where there's not many children, only one child or the mother is a, can uh, just make... We knew, you see, that we were a bit underprivileged. <laughs> the child flower was like a little mecca, really, for one day of the week on Sunday most of the, for most of the villagers to go to. Of course, of course, the chapel treat we especially looked forward to because we used to sit on a nice grassy bank at the back of the chapel and uh, the ladies who were out to do all the work at the chapel used to make us the most marvellous tea. They used to bring our big ampers, piled up with lovely fresh bread and butter and it didn't matter how much you ate, they'd still come out with more, which is what we found extraordinary. You could eat a dozen pieces, and if you had room for it, and my God, we made room for it. The pig was very important in village economy. I mean, most people had a pig's cut like this, or a bit smaller, and um, of course they fed a good deal from the acorns in the woods, so they didn't cost all that much to keep. Of course, it was a, that was another big excitement for us children. Pigs had to be killed in the autumn in the cold weather from the point of view of sorting it and keeping the pig. And of course, the butcher used to come. The poor old pig was tied up and carried out squealing, which caused the little girls found terrible. We used to think it was like murder. We used to put it on a bench out in the wood. And then 
Of course, the butcher used to stick it, and up came Mrs. Pother, who lived in the end of this cottage in Longview with a big wash and uh, the jug belonging to the wash and stand set, and she used to catch the blood as it gushed out to make black puddings, which was a great delicacy. And uh, because then they burnt the straw on the pigs, and of course it was in the autumn getting dark, and you can imagine what it's like, the fire and the blood gushing out of the pig. And of course the little boys were dancing, Now what they wanted was the pig's bladder. And when the pig's bladder was got out, the butcher used to throw it to them, and then there was a real scramble to get out of it. I've got the pig's bladder, let's have a go. And they would blow it up and kick it about. And, oh, it would last them sometimes a week, I've known the pig's bladder. I think also we were quite a bit isolated. And if you are isolated, everybody in a village is a somebody. You see, we were all terribly interested in each other. If somebody got married, or somebody died, or somebody was ill, everybody was naturally concerned. It made a talking point. That was it, you know, for the time being. So you feel it more important. People were important, even if it's only in a small group. I mean, what makes you important as a person is who is interested in you, isn't it? Really interested. And I think in village life, the people were terribly interested in each other. And, and did help each other. I mean, if men uh, where there was a widow path, they'd put a bucket of coal by the doorstep, you know. I don't ever remember being bored when I was a child. I mean, I seemed to have such a lot of space all to ourselves. Little, a little kingdom, really. Every time we went out, we were in our, our own little kingdom. We could think what we liked, make up what we liked. And of course, it was lovely if you got a company with you, like I mostly had my little brother. It used to be lovely when that uh, man would send us on a uh, an errand, especially if it was over to Granny's. It's lovely to remember, even now, running down the, it was a very steep bank, and running down the perhaps getting a bit too fast, and then you come up against a tree to stop yourself, you know. The, the very feel of the place somehow, that this, it wasn't a smell, it was a um, pungent, um, the very earth hand, especially in the summer, especially if it had been raining a little bit, it was so pleasant. You know, frighten yourself with a bit. Oh, there's our own lassies too. Your turn to have a go carrying the cabbage. Then, well, you're the carrying, you'll be the biggest, and I'll give you to look after, not me. Stay sniffing, Debbie. She might get a bit stiff laying there. If you got really tired, oh, it was, there's always, you could always find a nice place you could sit down, even lay down. We shouldn't lie here, really. This moss is very grim by right. 